Hey, what's up, guys? So, <clears throat> I wanted to talk a little bit for a minute about the new Johnny Manziel Untold documentary that came out. Um, just saw it, and there's there's a lot of interesting stuff in it. And the main thing that I wanted to address was from the jump, before I get into any of this, he's probably the most talented, arguably one of the most talented players ever to touch a football and threw it all away based on his own decisions and just lack of desire to really create anything and become anything of himself in the NFL with that talent. So I want to preface it by that, not trying to make excuses for him or say that, you know, it's not his fault because it is. He was the guy with the talent and he threw it all away. He 100% threw it all away with his own decisions. But, I mean, the stuff in this documentary is just so crazy when you see the in-depth stuff that happened. And I want to talk about a couple things because I think there's probably some people who misunderstand a lot of things in the documentary. The one thing I wanted to touch base on um, was they said he watches a Zero film. And I think a lot of people took that out of context. Zero film refers to he doesn't take the iPad home with him. He doesn't do extra work, which, I mean, come on, guys, we already knew that. He doesn't do extra work. But when you're in an NFL facility or you're playing for a team, 90% of your day is in the meeting rooms watching film. So you have to watch film as, like, part of your position group meetings and offensive meetings. So when he's in the building, he has to watch film. Like, he doesn't have a choice. They put it up on the screen and say, hey, this is what we're watching. Um, yeah, so I think that was the first thing people were a little confused about. He does watch, he did watch film. He just didn't take the iPads and stuff home with him. He didn't watch extra film on his own. He didn't like go out of his way to watch film by himself. Um, the other thing that I want to touch base on with this is one, which is what I thought from the, from the get go when everything happened in Cleveland was he's really in a position where he doesn't want to be there. And especially with a guy with his personality and the way that he views things where he just will go, ah, fuck it. Um, Cleveland was the worst possible place for him to go. One, Cleveland wasn't a good team at that point at all. Um, and on the other side, there was the point of the coaching staff, the offensive coordinator, nobody wanted him there. So you have a guy with his personality on a team that's awful. He's never really dealt with adversity before. And then on top of that, the coaching staff, the offensive coordinator, none of them want him there. So now he's in a hostile environment with the coaching staff. And then because he's getting into it with the coaching staff and he's not doing extra work, then his teammates start to not like him. And it's just, it's a huge spiral effect. And he talks about this in the documentary. He basically kind of alludes to this and at one point just says, you know, it wasn't fun for me anymore. Like I, I didn't want to play football anymore. Like Cleveland broke my spirit and I want it out. And I think that's one part that we have to remember in this is he didn't just throw it away because he's like, well, I, I just don't want to do it. Cleveland made him think that he didn't want to play football football anymore so at that point he's like who cares if I throw it away I don't want to play football anymore um, but the big thing is he wanted out and he tried to force his way out in Cleveland he acted because he was on his after he had a little trip up at the combine which they talk about in the documentary um, trying to pass a drug test or something um, and after that he was basically on his best behavior in Cleveland he was going to work showing up doing his stuff um, but he, like, like I said, he very soon realized he didn't want to be there. And he wanted to force his way out. Well, in order to do that, he started behaving badly, going out, partying, drinking, trying to force Cleveland to release him, which is what I thought from the jump when everything originally went down. I said, uh, I was like, he's not this stupid. He's trying to force his way out. He's trying to make sure he can get out of Cleveland. And... That's exactly what happened. He just wanted out of Cleveland. And he never thought the repercussions of what he did with his level of talent, who he is, he's Johnny Football. He never thought 
that Johnny Football wouldn't get picked up by somebody else. Like once he got released, he never thought that he wouldn't get a job for some other team. Like he thought 100% for sure, regardless of how bad he acted, somebody else would pick him up and go, oh, well, we can fix him. I mean, we always see that in the NFL. Oh, we can fix him. It'd be different once he's in our building. And he thought that was going to happen. Hey, I'm going to behave badly. I'm going to get out of here. Somebody else will take a shot at me. And then I'll go back to, you know, behaving properly and trying to, you know, make something out of my career. And once nobody signed him and he saw the full repercussions of what he had done, and he's like, oh shit, this didn't go at all how I planned. Then everything was just a spiral because then at that point where it's just, well, if nobody's signed me, fuck it then. I'm going to have a good time. I'm going to party. I'm going to do what I want to do. And yeah, when nobody signed him, it just all spiraled out of control and um, really led to, you know, ultimately the immense downfall that we all, you know, witnessed. Um, but the real angle that I wanted to take to get into on this is he talks about in the documentary that he doesn't really think that it would have mattered, you know, where he went. He, he, looking back now, he believes that, you know, he probably would have ended up, um, you know, being himself and at that point in his life, ruining his career anywhere. Um, but he was on the Pat McAfee show and he alluded that maybe it could have mattered if he went somewhere else. And I'm 100% on, on board with that idea. Like, you know, obviously Johnny was always going to be a partier. Um, he always was going to have his issues, but I don't think it would have been the complete train wreck that it was if he went somewhere else. Um, so let's talk about it. The situation, Dallas is on the clock at 16. Zach Martin and Johnny Manziel are on the board. And he talked about this in the documentary. I mean, he had gone on vacation with Jerry Jones and stuff when he was at Texas A&M. He's thinking, my buddy Jerry's on the board. He goes, I'm going. And he says, I'm, I'm going to the fucking Cowboys. That's what he told his agent when he didn't go number one to Houston. He said, hell yeah, I'm going to the fucking Cowboys. And the Cowboys are on the clock. And they take Zach Martin. Now, I'm not going to sit here and say that, you know, Zach Martin was a phenomenal pick. Zach Martin's one of the best offensive linemen of all time, easily top five. Um, so, I mean, you can't argue with that pick. It was a great pick. But I want to talk about the what if. What if Jerry Jones had pulled a Jerry Jones and taken Johnny Manziel? What that would have looked like for him and for the Cowboys. One, in Cleveland, he was sitting behind Josh McCown. Not the same type of quarterback. There's there's nothing he can learn with his skill set from Josh McCown. Tony Romo, on the other hand, is the exact same type of player as him. You know, scramble around, get loose, take some shots down the field, you know, throw off platform. Tony Romo was a poor man's Johnny Manziel, like athletically. Like it was very, very similar play styles, just obviously Johnny was more athletic than Tony. But he could have learned a lot from Tony and how to use his skill set properly from Tony. Um, also, there would have been no pressure, absolutely no pressure to be the starter right away, which would have calmed down the whole hype train, which is what he talked about when he came back to Cleveland, was, hey, you know, the whole hype train for his second year is like, you know, the hype train's all kind of calmed down to me now, and that's a good thing for me. You know, he's a young kid, calm the hype down. That would have been great for him. Um, the other part of it is, too, is... He would have wanted to be there. He's been a Cowboys fan since he was a kid. He's always wanted to be a Cowboy. And he and if he would have been at a place that he wanted versus a place that he didn't want to be, he would have taken it a lot more seriously. And I think we can all say that with everything in our lives. I'm going to handle something more seriously if it's something that I want or something that I want to do or something that I care about. I handle it a lot more seriously than if it's something I don't care about. You know, if I have a shirt that I don't care about, I'm going to take it out, get it dirty, work in it. I'm not going to do that with a shirt I care about. I'm going to take care of that. So <clears throat> I think for lack of a better term, he would have taken care of his opportunity and nurtured his opportunity better um, in Dallas because it's some place that he cared about that he would have wanted to be. And he would have felt like he was actually learning and progressing his career. Um, but... On the other side, Dallas was also a, a team that was completely equipped to handle situations like this. Dallas has always had, you know, guys like this that have trouble off the field and stuff. And yes, that's not ideal for your quarterback. 
but at the same time, he wouldn't have been the starter, and he would have got a chance to learn for two, three years how to be a pro before he'd have to step into that role and actually be like, okay, man, now it's time to get your shit together. You're the leader of this. You're the leader of this team now. So I think that would have been a, a huge benefit for him. But Dallas, on the other hand, remember when they drafted Des Bryant? Des Bryant lived with a member of the coaching staff for like five years after Dallas drafted him because they couldn't trust him off the field. And like I said, if he's your starter franchise as a rookie, mm -hmm. you, you got to have somebody who can come in and be mature. But as a backup, as somebody you're grooming to be the starter, that could have been part of his grooming process in Dallas. Is, hey, we're going to have somebody supervise you. We're going to start to teach you how to deal with the fame, how to deal with the money, how to deal with yourself off the field. And over the next couple of years, had taught him how to develop good habits and grow up and hold him accountable without him having to be the starter because you had Tony there. Could have totally altered his career and the trajectory of his career. And obviously would have altered where Dallas is right now. Because um, obviously, I mean, it's, it's not even an argument, guys. I mean, whether he was successful in the NFL or not, like I said, we all know that's attributed to his lifestyle and his personality off the field. On the field, he's 1,000 times more talented than Dak Prescott. He's the most exciting college player ever. I mean, him versus Dak just on the field. I mean, it's, it's not even close. Dak is just, he substitutes for those things with his intangibles and being a good leader. And that's what makes him a successful franchise quarterback and what stopped Manziel. It wasn't talent-wise. If you could train Manziel into how to actually be a professional and act the right way and be a leader on the team, I mean, the talent-wise, the talent wasn't even close. Um, so I think that would have been a huge difference in his career. If he goes to Dallas, Dallas teaches him how to be a grown-up, teaches him how to be a professional. And I know that you guys are all going to sit there and say, well, you shouldn't have to learn. I mean, come on, guys. The kid's 20 years old. He's 21 when he, by the time he gets in the NFL. You guys are telling me you could, you know 100% that you could handle being as famous basically as like Michael Jordan, being one of the most famous people in the world at 20 years old, being arguably the greatest college player of all time at 19 years old, guys, none of us know how we react in that situation. And yeah, he should have known better, but at the same time, he's a kid and he was trying to figure out how to just get through the, get through the world and enjoy being famous without going over the line and then not caring that he went over the line because he's a kid and he doesn't understand the ramifications of his actions. I mean, so you guys can make that argument, and it's fair, but at the same time, like I said, we're talking about the what if, what could have happened, what could have his career looked like, and ways to avoid what did happen. And I think one of the only ways to avoid what did happen is if he got drafted by Dallas or a place like Dallas that had a solid starter who was a similar play style to him. He could learn how to be successful on the field. He could have the organization monitor him and force him to learn how to be successful off the field and how to behave properly. He'd have a chance to learn and grow into the leadership and how to be a franchise quarterback. And things could have been totally different, guys. And for me, that's the question that really just this whole time has bugged me with the whole situation and irked me is what if? What if he could have just went somewhere else that would have actually gave him a chance to be successful? Because, um, I mean, I was a huge Johnny Manziel fan. I, when, when I was playing football, I modeled my game after Johnny Manziel playing quarterback. And for me, it was just heartbreaking because I was such a big fan of him and how he played the game. And it was, it was tough to just be like, it was two years and is gone. You know, the one of the greatest players, one of the greatest quarterbacks on the field in college that I had ever seen was just gone and we and there was we never got to watch that again. We never got to see it again. It was something so phenomenal that was taken away from us. And I think a lot of us are so angry um at him for blowing the opportunity or this and that because not that we're jealous of the opportunity, we're selfish and we wanted to continue to watch. We wanted to continue to see him. 
and we're now selfishly upset that he robbed us of our, of our opportunity to see him versus really whether he cared or didn't care. I mean, yeah, you sit there and go, well, yeah, it's a shame to have that much talent and not care, but if he doesn't care and he didn't want to play football, it, it's what it is, guys. The only reason we care is because, like I said, I, I don't really think it was us being angry. I think that's a small part of it. Of, well, so much talent wasted. I think that's a small part of it, but I think the bigger part was he was so electrifying and he was so good that we are angry that we got robbed of the opportunity to watch that for another 8, 9, 10, 15 years. Um, but yeah, like I said, he if he goes to Dallas, supervised off the field, not instantly the starter, learns correctly how to play from a guy with a similar play style on the field, I think things could have been really different. And it would have been really, really fun and really, really interesting to see where his career would have went, um, where the Cowboys would be right now. Um, it's, it's definitely something to think about. And that's something that I wanted to bring up here and kind of dive into um, because obviously everybody's always talking about, well, he just ruined his career and he threw all this away. And I really just wanted to say like, you know, yeah, Cleveland guys, but let's really think about what happened in Cleveland and why he basically threw it away in Cleveland and what would have happened if he wasn't in Cleveland. Um, because that's the, I mean, we all know what happened. I think that's the more productive conversation for me is even like looking forward with maybe future guys like this. How do we stop it from happening again? What should we do to prevent a kid who's 21 years old, who doesn't understand what he's doing and the ramification of his actions? How do we stop him from throwing his entire life and his entire career away? How do we stop him from self-destructing? And we can't just say, well, they're grown up, so they should be able to deal with it. Because yes, you got you got guys that come in and they're like Joe Burrow and Mahomes and Dak and they're leaders and they're mature instantly. But that doesn't mean we shouldn't try to help immensely talented guys understand ramifications of decisions that they make and try to help them from not completely destroying their lives and destroying their careers. I mean, that is that is our job, is to not just say, well, you're a grown-up, make your own decisions. The more productive conversation is how do we prevent these things from happening and how do we help these guys grow up and start to understand what's happening so they don't look back 8, 9, 10, 20 years down the road and say, man, if I would have just been mature at that point, if I would have just been had the resources to to tell me what was gonna happen with the decisions I made, God, how my life could have been different. I think we all need that in in our lives. And and like I said, for me, that's the more productive conversation. So that's why I wanted to kind of touch base on this and hey, let's play the what if and let's think about. You know, things outside of just, oh, well, you know, he got drunk and high all the time and threw his career away. Let's let's look at this from a more interesting standpoint and more interesting point of view of what could have happened. How do we stop it from happening again? So that's why I want, that's the angle I want to take with this, guys. I appreciate you listening to me on my soapbox about Johnny Manziel for a minute. And uh, we got more stuff coming soon. Ten days. Go Irish. Irish coming soon. Sam Hartman going to be a sleeper for maybe the best quarterback in the nation. Maybe. We'll talk about that. I'll make a video about Sam Hartman. Stud, sleeper pick, sleeper Heisman pick, sleeper number one pick. Um, Sam Hartman's going to be sneaky good. But thanks, guys. Talk to you soon. And uh, till next time. <laughs>